Welcome back for part three of the radar equation lecture in the introduction to radar systems course and this is lecture two. Okay now let's look at one example and with that I'm going to take you through the radar range equation once for one radar carefully so that you can get an idea how this this equation how we deal with it and how we do the algebra and so we're going to start off with a problem we're going to we, the problem I state is show that a radar with the parameters listed right here uh, will get a reasonable signal to noise ratio on a small aircraft at a 60 mile range well I just mentioned a little bit before that a radar like that was an air, the, the airport surveillance radars the ASRs and this is pretty much what ASRs parameters would be um, and a small aircraft would be a single engine uh, privately owned aircraft, the Piper Cherokee or something. They typically have a size, a radar cross section of about one meter squared. And the range we'd like to see that aircraft out to would be 60 nautical miles. And uh, the peak power of that radar is 1.4 megawatts. The duty cycle is uh, uh, one half of uh, its, uh, let's see, a half times 10 to the minus 3. The pulse width of this particular radar I'm talking about is 0.6 microseconds. The bandwidth, that's the frequency shape, you know, how over what width of frequencies we're sending energy, is uh, 1.6 megahertz. The frequency of the radar is S-band, 2800 megahertz, which is about 10 centimeters. And this, these antennas rotate 12.8 RPMs, about every 4.7 seconds, uh, seconds the radar goes, makes one revolution of 360 degrees. And while it's doing that rotation continuously, it's emitting pulses out at a rate of 1,200 approximately per second. And the antenna size is 5 meters high by 2.7 uh, meters, excuse me, 4. 9 meters wide by 2.7 meters high and it actually has some beam shape losses because it, the way the antenna does its shaping is to have good coverage at high altitude so its effective antenna size is a little smaller. I'll go over that over here and the beam width is about 1.3 degrees and for this particular radar we have about a 950 degree system noise temperature. I mentioned in passing this 2800 uh, um, megahertz million cycles per second corresponds to about 10 centimeters and here we do the calculation turns out it's exactly it's 0.103 uh, meters and to calculate the gain of this antenna we have its antenna size remember I mentioned it's for earlier it's 4 pi a over lambda squared which would give us 42 b dB, but actually it's 33 dB because we have a huge beam shape loss to shape this beam so that a lot of extra energy will go in the high elevation angles. So aircraft that are in the terminal area that are up at high elevation angles will, will get good, uh, good strength of the beam. It's called, uh, we'll may get into it later in the antenna section, it's called a, a cosecant squared beam. It's where the gain is constant at a given altitude up to a range and then comes out. You pay for that in the beam shape, as you can see. There's a 9 dB loss in order to get that coverage up at the high angles. And the number, when you do the algebra of seeing how often the, um, how fast the antenna rotates, uh, there are, as the uh, the target whizzes by a, a uh, excuse me as the beam uh, rotates by a target we'll have about 21 pulses on the target we we're up in uh, within two or three dB of the maximum of the beam and we're going to assume losses of about 8 dB other than this loss of 8 dB uh, in the system Okay, now let's calculate what the signal to noise is we get. So here is the uh, track signal to noise ratio. And we see it's got the peak power, the gain, wavelength, the cross section, some constants, 
k and the 4 pi to the cube, the range, the system noise temperature, the bandwidth, and all the losses. And from the previous page, here are just what these quantities are. And if we, first I'm going to do the calculation in scientific notation um, for the physicists and the scientists in the crowd, what they'd be used to. So I've just put down uh, a 1.4 times 10 to the 6 watts. Uh, the gain, 33 dB, and natural units is 2,000. We've got the gain twice, so the gain, 2,000 and 2,000. And then the wavelength, I've rounded the wavelength to 0.1 meters. It's 0.103. And uh, so 0.1, because lambda squared, I've got it twice. And then 1 meter squared for the cross-section of the target. Then we move down, and 1984 is 4 pi cubed. And then we have the range to the fourth power in meters, the range of 60 nautical miles transformed in, transforms into 1.11 times 10 to the fifth meters, and that's 111 kilometers. We have to put that into the fourth power. And then we have Boltzmann's constant, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 watts per hertz per degree Kelvin. Uh, the, the temperature, the system temperature of 950 degrees, remember that's in the units of Kelvin. The loss of 8 dB in natural units, and remember you won't want to take, you don't want to mix dB and, and natural units when you're doing this. We're doing this all in natural units this time. Next time we'll do it in, in dB units. And then, uh, and then we have the bandwidth in Hertz. And notice I've made sure that we're all in uh, MKS units, meters, kilo, uh, kilograms, and seconds. We have watts and meters, so I'm not putting meters up here and kilometers down here. You want all the different units to cancel out. And if you look very carefully, you'll see they all cancel out. You'll see that up here we have uh, watts, and the watts cancel out. And we have meters to the fourth power. Here, meters to the fourth power. Uh, this degree Kelvin cancels that one, this hertz cancels that hertz, and we just have a ratio, a, ra a power, a ratio of two powers. So when we take all the numbers here, uh, we have the 2, the 2, and the 1.4 give us 5.6, and then we take all the different powers, and they're right here, of 10, and then down below we do the same thing and we get 415, and all these different powers of 10, and then bump it down to uh, increase, uh, move this to a, uh, a number between 1 and 10, and we end up with 1.35 in natural units, which now we'll go back to dB, it's 1.3 dB. Now, that means per pulse we have a signal to noise ratio of 1.3 dB. Now if we have 21 pulses and we coherently integrate them. If we take a uh, logarithm to the base 10 of 21, we get 13.2 dB. And we add the integration gain, and lo and behold, we get a signal to noise ratio for the total of those t uh, 21 pulses that will see the target of 14.5 dB, which is a good signal to noise ratio. If it will be plenty above the noise and we'll have good detectability. Great. Now let's do exactly the same calculation in logarithmic units. We put down all our same parameters, only we first take the logarithms of the numbers. And again, changing them to natural units before we take the logarithms. 1.4 megawatts, and if you remember back, that's on the top of the equation. So that's a plus dB, that's 61.5. The gain is 33 dB, but that's squared, so we add logarithms, 66 dB. The wavelength is 0.1, which is minus 10 dB. Twice makes it minus 20 dB. It's in the top, but it's still a minus. The cross-section, again in the numerator, is 1, logarithm of 1 is 0, so that gets a 0. Now we go to the denominator of the equation, and these should be mostly negatives. 
unless the two negatives make a positive. And in the 1984, when you take the logarithm to the base 10 of that, you get 33. We take the range of 110 kilometers, but remember, we have to take that to the fourth power, which means take the logarithm and then multiply it by 4. And that total number is a big number, 201.8. Notice how on the negative side of things, that range really comes in strong. Then we take Boltzmann's constant, which comes out to be minus 228.6 because of the minus in this exponent. But it's on the bottom, so it becomes a plus. The minus becomes a plus and comes up here. The system losses are about near 1,000, almost 1,000, 29.8 dB in the negative side of things. Then the losses, 8 dB on the negative side. And the bandwidth of 1.6 times 10 to the 6th comes out to be 62.2. So what we have here are a whole bunch of positives. And remember, these are exponents. And when you deal with exponents, you add them. So we add up all these numbers, and we get 356.1. And all the negatives, 354.8, grand total of 1.3 dB. When we integrate the 21, same as before, when we integrate the 21 pulses, we're adding another 13.2 dB, and we come out with the same number. Yay, 14.5 dB. That's just a nice way of showing you how the radar equation works both in natural units and in logarithms. I want to make a couple of points about now generally about the radar equation before we finish. Okay. Uh, the radar equation uh, is simple enough, and this was said by a colleague of mine, Steve Wiener, that everyone can learn to use it. It's complicated enough that anyone can mess it up if you're not careful. And one of the reasons I put that example of the radar equation in is you can use it as a template. I have a lot of Excel spreadsheets uh, that I use. One can make up an Excel spreadsheet. And if you've got the units all right in your spreadsheet and you know what units you're supposed to put in, the algebra will all set, it, and set itself right. So, but the thing is, it's a simple set of uh, algebraic expressions. It's nice sometimes to have a template, whether you think in terms of dB or natural units, you can or scientific notation, you can go through it. One thing about the radar equation you want to do is say it's a, do some sanity checks. Take a candidate radar system, and here's that uh, form of the radar equation, which has all the characteristics of the radar and all the characteristics of the, the performance characteristics, the requirements and check it dimensionally. Make sure that all your units, and I implicitly, I might have said it lightly, make sure it checks out dimensionally and you, you, and you have the right units everywhere. See if it makes sense that when you do a calculation with one range or another range, increasing the range and signal to noise make the requirements tougher and uh, decreasing the cross-section and the time make the requirements tougher, etc. Well, now we're going to look at how the radar equation and the detection process all fit together. And that's shown uh, figuratively in this block diagram. We're going to spend a few minutes going over it. It'll be a really good recapitulation of what we learned in Lecture 2, the radar equation, and it will show how the results of what you do when you calculate the signal-to-noise ratio of a radar uh, using the radar equation fit into the whole detection process of asking the question, uh, is a target really there when it uh, appears to be there? Is that a detection from noise or is it a detection from the real target? Now, we've learned in this lecture that the radar equation connects the properties of the radar, the pr characteristics of the target, the range to the target, and the properties of the medium. And let's just go over them one at a time. We've, we, uh, the properties of the radar, which are going to contribute to how strong the signal is in an average sense relative to the average noise power, are the radar transmitter power, 
the antenna gain, that's how directive the antenna is, the frequency of the radar, the pulse width, uh, and the waveform that we're using. So all of these characteristics that feed into the radar equation are parts of the radar, the parameters that the radar designer can, has in his control, or her control. Then there are the characteristics of the target. It's uh, um, effective electronic area, uh, how much of the incident wave of a, a microwave energy from the radar is reflected back towards the radar. And that cross-section, that cross-section, effective cross-sectional area, electronic area of the target, will depend on the uh, angle that the target is, just uh, and also the frequency of the radiation. Uh, and relative size of the wavelength of the um, radiation to the size of the target. Now, uh, it'll depend on angle for just about every target except the sphere, because a sphere has the same cross-section no matter how it's oriented. But for most targets, say we had a big flat plate, a flat plate, oh, a meter by a meter, uh, and it was a half an inch thick. If an incident electromagnetic wave hit that plate uh, and the plate was perpendicular to the radar, a large amount of energy would be reflected back. That's called the specular, and we'll learn about that and those kinds of issues in the lecture uh, on radar cross-section of targets. But if the plate was located at an angle, uh, just like uh, light is Bent, uh, is uh, reflected when it hits a mirror, a large part of the energy would go off in another direction, and, uh, and it turns out for a radar only a small amount of it would be reflected back. So it's a, the target cr characteristics, particularly its cross-section, are going to depend on the angle and also the frequency of the radar. And we'll see how it depends on the frequency of the radar uh, later on in the, in the target cross-section le lecture. We learned that the signal-to-noise ratio is a very strong function of, of the range to the target. One signal-to-noise ratio is proportional to 1 over r to the fourth. So the range to the target from the radar, that distance is a very important factor. And lastly, the properties of the medium that uh, the radar is propagating through. Um, as we'll call, as we, you'll see, we call in the you'll see in the next lecture on propagation, we call that the soup. What it has to all go through. There'll be attenuation of the electromagnetic wave versus frequency, and there'll be uh, rain requirements. You know, if the how how does an electromagnetic wave propagate through rain and fog and things like that? They all come into play, and what comes out is a signal to noise power ratio, we call it S over N or SNR, and, and that gives you an average sense of how big the power is of the signal relative to the power of the noise. And I said, in a general sense, we like that to be about 20, and that's 13 dB. Okay, and it will, it will, it will, for other characteristics you'll see in the de when we learn about the detection process and later on, sometimes you want it greater than 20. But you wanted, a, you know, a good factor of 10, 10 to at least 10, 20, or 35 or so, up in the 20, up in the uh, 13 dB to 17 or 18 dB, depending on other properties, target fluctuations, which I'll mention in a minute, and uh, other properties. But you want it up there pretty heavily. You want the two. Uh, p average power is separated with the target being bigger by at least an order of magnitude. Okay, But what, what's this detection process? Well, it turns out if you turn on a radio receiver and you just go to a, some frequency and you listen, you, you don't hear just one amplitude. You hear the amplitude going up and down. We call that static. You know, that's zzzz. And that's because the noise moves up and down. It, it fluctuates. It's a probabilistic thing in math called a random variable. And it, it fluctuates, and it's got an average power, but that it, it's not, you're not certain at any given measurement of the, at any given time what the actual value of the noise is because it's fluctuating up and down around that average power.
Okay, so it's a random variable, and also it turns out, um, excuse me, it right down here is that that's called the noise statistics. Most of the noise is Gaussian, most of the regular receiver noises, but there are other kinds of noises that can predominate. Noise from the atmosphere for certain radars in the uh, tens of megahertz frequency. And actually, this is a time I want to take just a little sidebar. You know, you read a book and a textbook, and they have down in the corner a little box and a little sidebar to explain something. So I'll get back to noise in a minute, but this is something that I probably didn't go over in enough care in lecture one, and I just want to take a second to go over it. And it has to do with the whole electromagnetic spectrum. When you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, as you think back for a minute, there was the HF portion, which is in the tens of megahertz, you know, uh, tens of meters, you know, in frequency and in wavelength. And then you moved up in a frequency, and you got to the very high frequency, VHF. Okay, the first was HF, then VHF. And VHF, I'll just say, is like 150 megahertz, uh, approximately a meter and a half. And then ultra-high frequency, about 435 megahertz. Okay? And then, uh, then you get over into what we call the microwave, the microwave region. Okay? And that goes from, like, L-band as we're moving up, that's about a, 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 a thousand megahertz or a gigahertz, at 1.2 is where the radars operate. And then, then we go up into the gigahertz region, we're in the gigahertz at L-band, you know, uh, a thousand megahertz is a gigahertz. And then we go up to uh, tens of gigahertz, and some radars operate up even higher with millimeter wavelengths at 35 or 90 gigahertz. Now, when we talk about propagation in the propagation lecture that's going to be coming up next, sometimes we'll just say um, uh, there's a propagation in effect that at high frequencies, uh, it, it's, it's more than at low frequencies. When we say in these next lectures high and low frequencies, we don't mean the frequencies way back down there of 10 megahertz, which are the HF region. There's sort of an ambiguity in the way people talk about it. We mean the high frequency portion of the microwave region, okay, or the low frequency portion of the microwave region. And we don't say of the microwave region when we refer it, we say high frequency or low frequency, okay. So I want to, as we continue on, everything else pretty much will be just about um, the microwave region of the entire electromagnetic spectrum, and so that differentiates from the high frequency portion that which is down a very long wavelengths and uh, that's the end of the sidebar. Okay, now let's continue on. Uh, so I don't want you later on uh, back to the sidebar to get confused and say what did they mean back there? What did they mean back there? Okay, now as I said the noise statistics typically for a microwave radar uh, are Gaussian but if you're operating at some frequencies, and they would be the frequencies around 10 megahertz, you can have uh, noise that isn't Gaussian. So you have to worry about the noise statistics, and noise is a statistical property. Now let's move up to the target. Now let's consider, the, the, we mentioned that the target cross-section changes with aspect angle, with angle, okay? And the target can move while you're looking at it. But there are an awful lot of targets, as you'll see in the um, radar cross-section lecture when we show you the actual cross-section of the target as a function of aspect angle, that their contributions to the cross-section come from all different parts of the target. Most targets that you see, think of an airplane, are made up of a lot of different sub-targets. The radar range cell is much bigger in most cases than the target itself. So that you're going to get scattering from the jet inlets. Let's just pick a 747. You're going to get scattering from the nose of the aircraft. You're going to get scattering from the edge of the wing. 
You're going to get scattering from the jet engine inlets. You're going to get scattering from the back elevators. You're going to get sca uh, and, and the uh, horizontal stabilizers. And if you and that's if you're looking nose on. If you're looking on the side, you'll get scattering from the wingtips. You'll get scattering from a big specula from the side of the aircraft and you'll get scattering from the sides of the jet engines that are underneath the wings. And if it's at other angles, all sorts of things. Now, all these different scattering centers um, add coherently to give you the echo that goes back to the target. Okay? Now, if, and, the, and these can add constructively and destructively, they're all electromagnetic waves with phases in and out. And remember, if you're dealing with wavelengths that are, um, say, L band or S band, 23 centimeters, just a small change can move one scattering center from another. Small change in orientation of the aircraft can move one scattering center from the, from, uh, to, to interfere with another. So that as you look at the target, just sometimes vibrations of the target can cause the target's cross-section to fluctuate up and down a little bit and as the target moves in a more grosser manner can have it cross fluctuate up and down. My big point is the targets fluctuate up and down an awful lot too in most cases and again the only one that doesn't fluctuate is a sphere. How many tar times do you have a radar target that's just a sphere? Well, we do have satellites up in space that are just spheres that are used for calibration. But and in any case, um, so most targets fluctuate, and we characterize how they fluctuate with different models, and we'll get into that into the in the radar target cross in the detection actually in the detection lecture, which is where this whole business is going to be gone over in great and gory detail in lecture five. And what I want to do is to sort of bridge the gap ahead of time, steal a little bit of my thunder as to what's going on between the radar equation and that detection lecture. So feeding in to the detection process is fluctuating noise, fluctuating target, and also how we set a threshold. Ideally you'd like the distribution of the target signal to be well separated and much higher in power than the distribution of the noise. Then you can in between put a nice clean threshold and you always see the target and you never see the noise. But that isn't the case. These distributions are broad, they overlap somewhat. And there's the whole issue of setting a threshold so that you, when you do have a threshold crossing, you maximize the probability that you're detecting a target and you minimize the probability that you're detecting noise. And what we call this probability of detecting a target, we call PD, probability of detection. It means when you do get a threshold crossing, it is indeed a target. And we call down here probability of detection noise, the PFA, probability of a false alarm. We think it's a target, but it isn't a target. So this is how this all fits together. And uh, sometimes it's good to say, uh, to hear something, get a, get a, it's like see the preview to a movie. This is a preview to the movie of chapter five, of uh, lecture five that we'll be going over in a lecture or two. And to show you how it fits in nice and synergistically with the radar equation. Okay? Now, let's go on to the summary for the lecture. So, the radar equation provides that simple connection algebraically between the radar performance parameters and the design parameters. And there are different uh, uh, radar equations for different radar functions. There's a search radar equation and a track radar equation. Sometimes early on, I, I think I we used in the view graphs surveillance and, and, and search uh, uh, interchangeably. They're the same thing. Uh, and you can, uh, one thing you want to do is you, if you scale the radar equation, it gives you a really good feeling as to how the radar design might change it, it, to accommodate changing parameters. Like uh, if we need to double the range that the tar we have to see the target, what do we have to do to the power and the aperture? That sort of thing. Um, 
and a combination of the radar equation with cost and other constraints gives you an idea of what are the critical design factors. Uh, I want to just bring up with that point that we have not all talked about cost. And sometimes you, you can just do the radar equation and cost or technology or physical constraints can say, can't do it. And so these are key features that play into the radar design process itself. Uh, if if uh, you've only got in your budget have to build a, a, a hundred air traffic control radars and they have to cost uh, because there's only enough of the national resources to, for a couple hundred million dollars they have to cost a couple of hundred million dollars total you know a million or two dollars a radar times a hundred a uh, couple hundred million dollars so you say what's the performance that I can get in detectability and all those other issues for a million and a half dollars a whack for a radar for each Okay, or you might, and, and so performance and the amount of money really come into play. Another thing is, you look at the ideal radar f for a, a, to go on an airplane, and it turns out you want to build it at UHF frequencies. The design says on paper, but in fact that has to fit in the nose of an aircraft, and you've only got a meter of aperture. Well, if you can't put a, you would put a UHF radar with a meter of aperture, it'll have a huge uh, beam width, which might, may not meet your accuracy requirements. So there's a lot of different uh, trade-offs. And again, technology. Sometimes things you want to do, specifications of uh, how much power you need. Maybe there isn't technology to build with the size and weight constraints to get the kind of power you want for the cost, too. So it's a complicated trade-off. And that whole field we call radar system engineering. Now, when you look at the radar equation, sometimes you can get unexpected results. And when you do that, you have to look and say, hey, did I make an algebraic mistake? Do sanity checks. See if things make sense, OK? And look for hidden variables or constraints, as I said, like constraints on of uh, transportation, uh, the emplacement of the radar, cost, technology, and try to com pair parameters with those of other real radars. That's really the best way. You look and you see the design of a certain radar. It's got certain characteristics. You say, oh, that looks like the, the FPS uh, whatever, whatever radar. You go over and you say, gee, that can't perform that well. What's the difference? So if you compare it with a real radar, a lot of times you can really um, bring yourself back to sanity and get to the best radar design. OK, fine. Here are the references uh, that we used extensively for these for this lecture and uh, we'll move on in a little bit to the next lecture